Good afternoon. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. It's after lunch. I'm afraid people might fall asleep. Uh, well, well, first, it, as a, you probably may have heard this by now, but this is my very first trip to Hungary. Um, I've been trying to get to Hungary for quite some time, so it was a pleasure to finally come. I'm sorry it's such a short trip. It's only going to be two days. But it's sandwiched in between um, a trip to China, which we just returned from, and a trip to Argentina, which we'll be going to this weekend. So in between is Hungary. Uh, so, um, but uh, what, what, one of the things that obviously, um, as, you just, as you just mentioned, that, that made the timing for this interesting was the fact that you're in the middle of this discussion about building a nuclear power plant. And um, this has become a bit of a rarity in NEA countries to talk about building new plants at this point in time because it's a very stressful time in the nuclear industry, and I want to talk about that a bit. But uh, to start, I think what I'll do is begin by just giving you a little bit of a broad overview of the NEA. Um, I, I suspect that many of you um, have interacted with the IAEA probably more than the NEA, so I wanted to give you a bit more background. Um, we are obviously a much smaller organization than the IEEA. We don't have the global membership. We are um, a much more focused membership, 33 countries. And in large respect, <coughs> the countries of the NEA are the countries that have the deepest background and experience in nuclear technology, and nuclear regulation, uh, nuclear science, and, and, and other areas. And uh, the point of the NEA is to bring those countries together to solve difficult problems. Um, we just have all the flags up here. Um, I, I note that uh, the most recent members to the, join the NEA are uh, Argentina and Romania, which became members of the NEA just last year. Um, uh, China and India are not members of the NEA, but we have good relationships with both. And as, uh, in fact, our relationship with China is growing um, quite substantially. Um, who knows what the future holds, but you know, our work with them has, has been expanding a great deal. Um, we, are, we incorporate um, not just um, our, the, the, the work within the agency itself, but we have a lot of separately funded activities, which I'll show you again in a moment. But also we are the host of the NEA Data Bank, which collects uh, important computer uh, uh, software, <coughs> computer codes, and nuclear data that's used uh, throughout our membership. So I think some of you might be familiar with that. Um, this just gives you a snapshot of the committee structure that we have. This is the core of the NEA. Uh, these committees, which are um, experts that come from member countries, designated by their country to come to the NEA to work together to, to discuss a wide range of issues. As you can see, we have a, a lot of committees. We have two committees working on nuclear safety. Uh, we have radioactive waste, radiation protection, nuclear science, nuclear technology, and economics uh, here. Um, and this is also the management board for the data bank. So we have people that come together usually once or twice a year to participate in discussions. But each one of these committees um, is really um, an organization unto itself. And, and just to pick an example, the Nuclear Science Committee, as you can see here, um, has uh, you know, 25 to 30 experts on it. But under the Nuclear Science Committee is an infrastructure of expert groups and working groups on a wide range of issues. You can see here, um, this shows you the expert group on the economic management, uh, benchmarking of experimental data, accident tolerant fuels, and the nuclear science group also has some uh, research projects underway, uh, particularly, particularly this project on thermal dynamics of advanced fuels. Um, and all of the work of these committees, and this is true for nuclear science as well as the others, um, is usually represented in a series of reports that comes out on a continuous basis. So if you go to the NEA website, you'll see there's thousands and thousands of reports that have been over the years um, that cover a wide range of specific topics, and all of those are available for free download. So anytime you want to go to the website to download reports, uh, feel free to do so. Um, as I mentioned, we do have separately funded activities. Um, Generation 4 National Forum is a uh, collection of countries that are working together on advanced research to develop next generation nuclear power uh, uh, technology, um, a multinational design evaluation fr framework uh, uh, pr uh, program uh, brings together regulators from around the world 
uh, to synchronize their, their assessment of state-of-the-art technology, such as the latest VDR technology, um, AP1000, um, ABWR, they are all part of this. Um, the International Framework of Nuclear Energy Cooperation brings together both highly developed countries and developing countries to work on broad issues such as what to do about nuclear waste and how to finance nuclear power plants. Um, Hungary is a member of both MDEF and IFNEC, and, um, and particularly I think MDEF is an area where, where Hungary has been very active. There is a VDER working group this week that where uh, Stuck and Russia and uh, India are all working together to look at uh, assess the, the latest uh, version of the, um, of the VDER technology. Uh, we're also the home for these uh, joint projects. And this is a very important aspect of the work of the NEA because unlike most international organizations, um, our framework ena enables us to launch joint projects in a very, very um, quick fashion. We, we, don't, we can bring together uh, multiple players uh, to work on um, any subject that countries would like to approach. And after the creation of a very, um, very, very um, brief document, we can launch and do research together. So it doesn't require a lot of international negotiation, as you do normally have to do in the multinational context, because we already have that framework. So this is something we do quite often. We're, we're actually expanding this, uh, looking at some projects, which I'll talk about as we go forward. But as you can see, the projects cover a wide range of areas. And uh, Hungary participates in several projects, including the Halden Reactor Project, uh, the Lots of Force Coolant Project, and several others. Um, I note that the uh, Stutzvik Cladding Integrity Project is going to be meeting here in Budapest in, uh, in May, so some of you might be participating in that. So this is an area where, um, where we are able to work not just with our member countries, but also with others, you know, China's members of, of several of these, these working groups, India's on a few, um, so we're able to work with a broad range of countries, and we have a lot of flexibility with this. Um, <clears throat> I wanted to sort of highlight two such projects that are ongoing right now. Uh, BSAF is a benchmark study on the accident of Fukushima, um, and this is a very interesting research project that countries have come together to, 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 to work on. Uh, what this project does is it brings, it looks at all the severe accident codes in our member countries and uh, runs the Fukushima scenario with the severe accident codes. And then to see whether the codes agree with each other first. And you'll be happy to know that there is a lot of agreement. There are some differences, but there's a lot of agreement. And then to look at how the codes compare to the actual experience of Fukushima. And again, there's very good agreement. So we were very, we built a lot of confidence with that. So we launched a second phase of BSAF to try to project the scenario of Fukushima out further in order to try to estimate where the core debris may have deposited within the reactors. So that's a very important project. And SARF is another project related to Fukushima Daiichi that's focused on getting water samples from the plant itself and doing some chemical analysis in order to try to anticipate what the core debris might be composed of. So these are two important research projects uh, that we're engaged in right now. And uh, I highlight those obviously because uh, I want to spend a few minutes talking about the Fukushima Daiichi experience. Um, you know, it's, it's hard to believe that it's now been um, almost seven years since the accident. Uh, the time has gone by very quickly for those of us who have been in the middle of this. Um, I think it's now a good time to sort of take a step back and, and to think about what the accident really meant uh, to the future. Um, again, I'll talk about that a little bit uh, as we go forward. But obviously, um, if you're in the regulatory community, and particularly or the operations community, uh, Fukushima has had a very, very large impact. Um, and I think that when we look at this, it, there's a lot of people around the world that might think that the accident told us something substantive about nuclear power that we didn't understand. Either the nuclear power plants weren't safe, or we weren't regulating them well. And you know, our member countries came together soon after the accident and wrote this report um, on the Fukushima accident. And they came to a very clear conclusion very quickly. And all the countries, including countries that later decided to step away from nuclear power like Germany, uh, concluded that the reactors are safe. That Fukushima was a very unusual set of circumstances. There were some very specific circumstances related to that, that site. Um, but there's also the recognition that 
Um, not all nuclear power plants are going to be exposed to massive tsunamis. And so we don't think there's anything that came out of the, this experience that told us that nuclear power plants were safe or we weren't regulating correctly. Uh, however, uh, if you're working in the nuclear field, you know that you have to learn from experience. And the experience of having a severe event, uh, like a large tsunami or a massive earthquake, is something that we need to think about. And so that was something that had to be incorporated to our thinking about nuclear regulation, to be prepared for extreme events. We also found, and this is something that was something of a sensitive issue for quite some time after the accident, because um, particularly when I was at the Nuclear Regulatory Commission, uh, we didn't want to be in a position of sounding like we were criticizing the Japanese. You know, it wasn't our business to tell the world that the Japanese made mistakes. You know, we wanted the Japanese to say the Japanese made mistakes. And eventually, reports came out, and as I think all of you are aware, uh, that very soundly criticized um, how Japan uh, created a culture within the regulatory community and the operations community that did not take um, full account of the potential for nuclear accidents and really weren't prepared. Um, and when we looked at this, we saw that there were very clear indications that there were human failings in this process, both on the regulatory side and on the operations side. And so the, the fact that there's a human element that has to be accounted for is something that we take very seriously in the NEA, and we spent a lot of time uh, working on that. Um, so I, I always like to boil the, the accident down to what I call the big lessons that we we'll learn. Uh, obviously, the most important aspect, if you're going to site a nuclear power plant, you have to understand the physical hazards that that plant will face. It's a very simple, well-understood principle, but I think that until the accident in Japan, um, it never quite came home. We never really saw it um, lead to a problem. Uh, we always knew that flooding, earthquakes, other things could compromise the plant. We saw it happen in Fukushima, so this is being reinforced. <coughs> and around the world, we've seen people go back and look at their assessments and, and refine their assessments. Um, also, recognizing extreme events can happen. You know, we, we, we can't build any facility to withstand any possible event, but you know, you can't. We, we tend to ignore the once in a hundred thousand year event. But the truth is, the once in a hundred thousand year event could happen next week. And so the, the, the lesson of Fukushima really is, and this is probably the most important aspect from our standpoint, is we have to give plants the ability to respond to the unexpected. Uh, if there is a severe event at a plant, um, how do we respond? How do we enable the plant staff to be able to uh, rescue the situation, to prevent a severe accident from taking place? And that's really, I think, one of the most important things that came out of it. And as I mentioned, these human aspects of nuclear safety are, are going to be very important. Um, so we um, looked at these over the last several years, and we wrote a report that came out um, at the five-year mark um, where we, we, looked, we assessed what countries had actually done in the aftermath of the accident. And it would be, it's very gratifying to see that, that regulators and operators all around the world came to essentially the same conclusions about the accident, about what needed to happen. And so they've all gone about to reassess their, their, their natural hazards. They've all gone to look at how do we reinforce against flooding. They've all gone back to look at how do we provide for emergency cooling in case we lose all on-site and off-site power. So these sorts of things have all been done all over the world. It's been a very consistent message. Uh, we, they're organized different ways, they're called different things, there's a slightly different approaches in different countries, but the basic story is really very, very similar across the world. And so I think we've all come to very similar conclusions, and this report documents that uh, quite effectively. So, you know, I, I look back now at the accident. Um, I've been at, I went to Fukushima soon after the accident took place. Not that soon, it was several months. Uh, but it was still a very much of a crisis situation. And um, I, I remember when I went to the site, um, you know, the drive to the site from the staging area actually left a bigger impression on me than the visit to the site itself because I remember we were traveling through these very attractive parts of Japan, you know, all these you know, attracting neighborhoods with car dealerships and restaurants and, and the people were gone. And if you're a nuclear regulator and you see this, it leaves, a, it leaves an impression on you. And, and really everyone who went to the site after that, during that time frame, came back with a very sobering feeling 
but not feeling that we had to step away from nuclear power, but the feeling that we had to reinforce that there's a personal responsibility that everyone that's involved in this business has to take to their, to their position and has to bring that seriousness to their work. Um, so it's something that, you know, that certainly has had an impact on, on many of us, but it's really just reinforced what we already knew more than teaching us something that we didn't know. Now, all this, with all this that happened, um, I think a lot of people believe that we were going to have to walk away from nuclear power. There were certainly countries like Germany, which made the political decision to <coughs> shut down their plants. Uh, Italy, for example, um, could have built plants and was thinking about building plants and decided not to do that. Uh, but really, when, I, I, when you assess countries around the world, um, the pro most programs essentially stayed on the same course. Countries that were seriously considering building nuclear power plants really continued to do that. The countries that had programs moved forward. You know, in, in my country, at the Nuclear Regulatory Commission, uh, we had um, applications in place to build uh, new reactors, um, AP-1000 reactors, and the Fukushima incident happened. We assessed the situation, and we approved the construction of the plants. Um, and as a matter of fact, we even all, we also um, authorized the relicensing for 20 additional years of a Mark One BWR reactor, which was the same design that was used in Fukushima, because we thought it was safe. And we assessed it very carefully and concluded there was no reason not to move forward. Uh, so that means that nuclear power is still here and still around. And that's very convenient because uh, the world is now trying to come to grips with this issue of climate change. And you're all very familiar with COP21 and the agreement that was reached in 2015 in Paris. Um, but what, one of the things that I find as I talk to people about this that, that gets lost and is really quite interesting is that for some reason, people tend not to talk about energy as much as you would think. But energy is really the whole story. And energy is 60% of the story at least. And so if we're really going to be successful in dealing with climate change, it is really a question of how do we use and produce energy in the future. And, and it really boils down to that. The rest of it is almost peripheral to what we do on the energy side. Uh, so many countries, uh, particularly China and India, have already announced that their intent is to build more nuclear power plants as part of this. But we don't expect that all countries will do this. Uh, there are a lot of countries that are focusing on renewables, obviously. Uh, but nuclear power does seem to have a, a role to play here. Um, this is an interesting chart that we put together based on IEA data, International Energy Agency data. And this chart shows you some of the recent impacts. Unfortunately, this, 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 this isn't quite up to date because I think it will show you some more interesting effects. But you can see, um, if you look at the U.S., which is the blue line, it's been trending downwards for several years. Um, that's because of switching between coal and natural gas. Um, you see uh, Europe has been turning downward as well for lots of reasons, uh, less industrial activity, um, more energy efficiency, more use of renewables, just a combination of things. Um, here is Germany, which has kind of plateaued. The most recent data is actually trimming back up. I won't go into that any further. Um, and, um, and this is Japan, which I think is an interesting case, which shows you how it, its emissions have spiked up. Um, in the aftermath of the accident as the plants were shut down. Uh, Japan has been coming back. We now have five reactors back in operation. It's been a slow, painful process in Japan, but they are crawling their way back. But uh, the one that I always find interesting is this. This is France. And why that's particularly interesting is because from looking at the energy infrastructure alone, uh, France today meets the COP21 objectives. Um, now, if you told people in France that, they would be astonished because they never seem to recognize that nuclear power exists in France anymore. Uh, but the truth is that, that right now, France is the only industrialized country that meets those objectives right now and is the only country um, that has um, such a high reliance on nuclear power plants. Now, as France wants to move away from that and move more towards renewables, we expect to see their emissions go up. So it will be very interesting to see how that um, plays itself out. We, uh, we, we, are, we work closely with the International Energy Agency, and this is a chart that they put together as part of a study we worked on together. And the question that they were answering with this is basically, what does the world look like if COP21 is fully successful in 2050? And as you can see in this chart, 
it's, it, it's, a, it's a picture that says we need a little bit of everything. And this is done on a purely economic basis with no policy limitations. And they project that we're going to see massive increases in wind, massive increases in solar, use of carbon sequestration. Uh, this chart is also predicated on, I think, a 30% increase in energy efficiency across all sectors. Um, and even with that, you still have this big nuclear component here. And that is equivalent to about two and a half times um, global capacity right now. So, so IEA's projections anticipate that nuclear would have to grow substantially to fill uh, a, a, an even larger role. And obviously that's a lot of plants. That's about 500 new nuclear power plants globally. Um, and a lot of that would be in Asia, by the way. <coughs> now, if this is going to happen, though, uh, one has asked the question about the cost competitiveness of nuclear. Now, looking at it from a levelized cost standpoint, nuclear looks pretty, pretty good. Um, you know, nuclear looks very competitive with other, with coal, with, with, with natural gas, um, and um, it's actually cheaper than onshore wind and solar. So, you know, from that standpoint, nuclear looks very good. But increasingly, we are finding that um, the levelized cost is not a good measure of anything anymore. And that's partially because the markets have changed and, quite frankly, distorted dramatically uh, over the last several years. Um, market prices don't tell you what they used to tell you. And in most parts of the world, market prices are so low for electricity that there's not enough money being earned to invest in anything that's not being subsidized. So we, we have to move to a different model. And we've been looking at um, a system-wide approach. And by the way, we have a, a major report that will be coming out in the next month or so uh, that will provide some updated analysis on this point. Um, so I, I thought that in looking at this, rather than looking at levelized costs, which is the traditional way to look compare energy resources, um, something much more pragmatic has to be considered. And you know, we talk about this a lot within the NEA because there's we argue about this point, actually, about whether you should make these comparisons. But, you know, when I talk to people in industry, um, the fact that nuclear power is so much more expensive from the initial capital investment than other resources is a huge, huge barrier. Um, and, um, in, in Hungary, in the, the, the Pax program, um, if it weren't for the fact that the vendor uh, was able to show up with very, very... Um, advantageous financing terms, um, you probably would not have been able to build a plant. And that's the situation that I think many uh, countries are facing, because even if they want to build nuclear power plants, financing those plants is becoming a huge problem because of these very, very high capital costs. And we don't see those costs coming down. We actually see the costs going up, which is not what we expected. I expected by now to see the costs coming down. Uh, there's lots of reasons why those costs are going up. Uh, part of it is a lack of practice construction. You know, we, we don't build plants very often in Western countries, so the, the teams um, of project managers, the supply chains, they're not really in place. We don't have the experience of building plants on a regular basis, so we're not very good at it, quite frankly. So that's why you see these big cost overruns in France and Finland and the United States. Um, but you, but you know, and hopefully this will, will pay dividends with, with your project. Uh, Russia, China, and Korea uh, build plants quite regularly and are actually quite good at it. Um, another issue we're looking at is the, the fact that as renewables come into the grid, it's going to require more and more variable um, production of electricity from nuclear power plants. Um, this chart shows that if you have a 50% penetration of renewables, uh, that you have to have a pretty sizable ramp rate uh, both positively and negatively for the nuclear power plants uh, to fit that that, that model. <clears throat> now that's assuming you don't just that you don't find a way to store the renewable electricity. Uh, but if, if you run it the way we do today, you have to have these kinds of big um, ramp rates, and doing this cost effectively and safely will be a big challenge. Um, and um, put, putting all those things together, this is the analysis that we did a, a couple of years ago. So this is going to be updated. And we asked the question, so if you assume the renewables can come in in any quantity, how does nuclear fare against renewables? And as this chart shows, as renewables have more and more penetration, 
it basically comes in at the expense of, of nuclear. Nuclear shrinks as renewables come in. Now, this is, this is a theoretical analysis because one big question that we have is whether renewables can actually penetrate much more than 30 to 40 percent. There's real questions about that. Uh, our friends at IEA think they can get up to 75 or 80 percent. Um, EDF has done a very exhaustive, exhaustive study looking at this. They come up with 40 percent. Um, so I think there's a great debate about what's actually possible. And I'm afraid that some of that debate is tinged with ideology more than facts, unfortunately. And I think we're just going to have to wait and see what happens over the next 10 years. Uh, but this is something that, at least in our analysis, um, we have to take into consideration. This is driven entirely because of the capital costs. Um, so the challenge that I see before us is, you know, we have this problem with the electricity markets. They're, they're not functioning well. They're not giving us the price signals necessary to make investments um, in a logical fashion. And we're seeing, because of that, very, very low electricity prices. And in many markets, nuclear plants have become uneconomic and are shutting down. And that's a huge problem for the long-term future. Um, construction for new plants has not been very good for us because we, this is the fact, as I mentioned a while back. And um, on top of that, with everything that's going on, the nuclear industry has always, <laughs> always been very conservative anyway. Uh, regulators are very conservative, so having new technologies come in has been very, very difficult. And just at a time where we need to have more innovation, we're, we're not seeing it. Um, so, you know, we need innovation to really solve a lot of problems. We need innovation to make nuclear more cost effective, to enable you know, higher safety or lower costs, uh, to deal with the fuel cycle and nuclear waste, uh, really to fit into this future framework. And that's something that really requires a lot of innovation. But, you know, we're not doing the innovation as much as we need to. And that's, a, that's an issue for us. So that has prompted us at the NEA to launch an initiative called Nuclear Power, um, Nuclear Innovation 2050, um, which is designed to bring countries together to discuss what are the technologies that we really need to focus on. What, what are the technologies for the next 30 or 50 years? Um, and how do we get those technologies out of the laboratory and into use more quickly? Um, so we've, we've, we've worked with a variety of countries and a variety of experts, and we've identified these as kind of the, uh, the key technologies to focus on. Um, one that we are um, focused, that we're looking at right now, we're spending a lot of time, is action tolerant fuels. We found that there were a lot of countries that were particularly interested in, in advanced fuels, and so we've started to focus on that. And we've done, um, at least we've done one major workshop and a lot of activities since then. And uh, what we're trying to do now is to set a, a, a framework for uh, developing and validating advanced fuels in half the time um, that would normally be required. And so we're trying to work with both work with the regulators, um, the developers, uh, the industry, the laboratories, all to try to bring all the pieces together uh, to try to find a way to short shorten this, the development cycle. And that's really the whole point of NI2050, uh, to find ways to get innovation into market uh, much more quickly. And we think the secret of that is to work on a multinational basis to bring the regulators into the conversation. Um, if you know regulators, and I was a regulator, regulators don't want to have the conversation with developers about how to make their lives easier. It's not what we're here for. But, uh, because, uh, because we worry about looking like we're a part of the nuclear village, which is the term that Japanese use. We don't want to be captured um, and to even have the appearance of being captured by the industry. But if you do it on a multinational basis, it, 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 it basically makes it much, much easier for regulators to provide that input into the process and to give the, the input and advice to the industry as to how to go forward. So that's what we're trying to accomplish there. So I've already mentioned um, some key observations about what the real penetration for renewables is going to be. It's a big question for the future. Um, you know, we hear we, we talk a lot about carbon, um, about reducing carbon emissions, but when you look at the, the size of the of the, the issue, talking about reducing CO two emissions by eighty or ninety percent by twenty fifty, uh, we're nowhere near on path to do that. And and I don't see countries taking the substantive action to do that. Um, the OECD did an, did an economic analysis and said if we actually were to implement COP21 fully, 
um, what would the carbon tax look like? And the answer they came up with was between 100 and 120 euros per ton. And no one's talking about numbers like that. So it shows you how difficult this will be. Um, obviously, uh, the, the role of energy storage is something that people talk a lot about. But I think there's a lot of questions there. And um, you know, nuclear energy can have a large role in the future, but we, we think there's going to have to be some adapting. Um, now, we, when, one of the things that we often come up, we have, have, we're confronted with is the fact that if you look at the people who are working in the nuclear infrastructure around our member countries, it's an aging infrastructure. There's, there's pe the people who built the plants that are in place today, the people who designed the technologies, they're either retired or retiring, and we, we have only a trickle of people coming in many countries uh, to replace them. And that's something that has to be dealt with. So another initiative that we have launched um, is called NEST, the NEA Nuclear Education Skills and Technology Program. Um, now this is not designed to solve the problem on a massive basis, but what it is is a project <coughs> where we will provide opportunities for students in multiple countries to work on real, pro real issues, real problems, guided by professional scientists <coughs> Um, in places like PSI, for example, in Switzerland, or Argonne National Laboratory in the United States, places like that. Um, but to have students work together on a multinational basis, so students in Hungary can work with students in the United States, and with, with students in Japan, and with students in um, Argentina, and all work in one research project. Um, and that, we think, will excite students to be involved in some of these technologies and to do this on a multi multidisciplinary basis. So it's not just the nuclear engineers, but also bringing in the chemists and the physicists and the materials uh, scientists. So uh, that's something we're, we're focused on. Um, I'll close with just a couple of comments, because I know that uh, stakeholder engagement is something that you're very interested in. And it's, it's, it's another one of those lessons from Fukushima that we had focused on, because we think it's very important that uh, the public be involved in in any major decision with nuclear. And I think in Japan it was clear the public was not very involved. And that's definitely changed now. Um, but we find that this is a big issue around the world. Um, so we held a workshop last year, in Je last January, and we brought 140 senior officials together from around member countries and a few non-member countries to just compare notes and talk about well, what are we doing to engage our publics? And so we had a variety of sessions looking at different aspects, you know, siting nuclear waste sites, building new plants, extending the lives of existing plants, just lots of different issues. And we put these people together in these roundtable dialogue sessions. And this proved to be a really interesting exercise. So you got to have people with completely different backgrounds, you know, people that might be uranium experts sitting down with someone who was an ESPO expert sitting down with someone who was trying to deploy a nuclear power plant and talking about their experiences and engaging with the public. And uh, it was, I think we found it a pretty gratifying exercise. We had all these people, regulators were there, developers were there, lawyers were there, and, and they really had these very intensive conversations. And they came up with some conclusions, so I thought I'd share some of those conclusions with you. Well, one thing is, uh, and I think this is kind of obvious, is there's no magic solution. Um, there's nothing I can tell you about how to engage the public um, on a generic basis. I think it's a very, very specific issue for each situation. So there's no one size fits all. You know, each country will be different. Each situation will be different. Um, but there are some common things. And one, one thing that I think the group concluded is that the people who are proposing a nuclear related actions, officials and governments, um, officials and in industry, um, have to be prepared <coughs> to spend a significant amount of time with public engagement. They have to be able to sit down with the public and have the discussion. Um, and not be afraid of the fact it might take some time. Um, because what we have found is, if you, and this is something that came out of this conversation quite prominently, the people who tried not to talk to the public very much up front found that they were delayed on the back end as the situation became more complicated and they had to talk to the public. But then it slowed them down when they had a lot of money being spent. So it's much better to talk up front and to spend whatever time is necessary. Um, and we believe that the beginning by uh, just listening to what people are saying, understanding what their concerns are. And I think this is a very, very important aspect of this. 
that it's not just a matter of putting information out. And I think that's a traditional approach. Just put a lot of information out on websites or on releasing papers. It's really a dialogue. It's really sitting down with people and listening to what they're saying. Um, as an example, I, I was in Japan for an event uh, that engaged with the uh, evacuees from the Fukushima accident. And um, we, they had put together a format where select people from the evacuated community were able to ask questions of the experts that were there, both Japanese experts and international experts. And um, as the dialogue went on, I realized that one of the things that people were concerned about in the community was that it was possible for, the, for there to be another earthquake that would cause a problem at the Fukushima plant that would release more radiation and force people to evacuate. And I was amazed by that, because it never occurred to me, because I, I know the situation. I don't see a situation where another earthquake or tsunami is going to cause a massive nuclear accident at this point. And I talked to the Japanese, and I said, why don't you just tell them that that's not a likely scenario, that they don't have to worry about that. But they were sitting around worrying about that, and I, I, that never occurred to me. So this shows you that just talking to people will give you an insight to their concerns that perhaps you can answer. Um, bringing a young generation into it is very important. Nuclear decisions are generational and by nature. Building a nuclear power plant today will probably be operating 60 or 80 years from now. Um, so it makes sense to bring young people into it. And this is a practice we've done in our another part of the agency called the Forum on Stakeholder Confidence, where we work with countries to bring international experts in to sort of build the confidence about what the programs are to dispose of nuclear waste. And um, Switzerland did this last year with us. And um, they had high school and college uh, students participate, and that really became a very valuable part of it, because there were a lot of insights about how young people gather information and understand what they're hearing. Um, but at the, end, at the end of the day, it's important for people to understand that just because you're listening to what stakeholders are saying, it doesn't mean you're doing a poll and taking a vote. That's not what this is about. Um, it, it's, not, it's not a democratic process in that respect. It's really information gathering, and, and just because you know, most people in the room don't like what you're doing doesn't mean you stop. It means you have to understand what their concerns are. Um, let's see, I think I've talked, yeah, I, I, I want to emphasize that face-to-face -face interaction is very important. I, I, I've done that myself, I found it very valuable. And um, even if you've spent a lot of time doing it, uh, look at it as an opportunity, not as um, a burden. Uh, we issued this report uh, that, that provided more detail, again, on our website, uh, on the workshop on stakeholder involvement. And we're planning another workshop uh, next year, which will focus much more on risk communication. Um, so, with that, I will leave you with a nice picture of our building in um, the, the suburbs of France. Uh, my office is right here. <laughs> <laughs> nice one with the balcony. Come to my place, have some wine, look at the sin. Um, I advise, however, you wait till spring. It's a little cold out there right now. But if you have any questions, we'd be very happy to answer them. Thank you very much. Thank you.